What is going on, everybody? It's the France, and we have for AEW on TBS Review for March the 30th, 2022, the last show for me to review in the month of March, as we'll be going into WrestleMania week. Weekend on a Friday, which is going to be a very, very busy night. So, tonight was the start of the women's portion of the Owen Hart, uh, um, Owen Hart Foundation Tournament. With a new signed women's wrestler taking on the bunny. Who was that? Some people were right, some people were wrong. We'll talk about it here in a second. CM Punk took on Max Caster. Wheeler Yuta took on... Ryan Danielson, Jay Lethal versus John Moxley, and FTR takes on Ass. Well, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I mean the um Gun Club, Billy and Billy Sons, Billy um Austin Colton Gun. So that's pretty much your lineup for today. The beginning, the first match of the night: CM Punk versus Max Caster. Why is this match happening? I don't know. I guess they. they as we know, last week, after CM Punk won his match, he motioned for a championship, and he wants it to be the World Heavyweight title. CM Punk needs to wrestle some more, I guess, so they're getting him wins. One last week against one half of FTR. He won, he won tonight's match against Max Caster. Max Caster is the first person on the week um, um, on the show. Uh, we, we didn't even take... It wasn't even five minutes in and we get a Will, Will Smith reference on television tonight. I don't even think they did that on Monday. Anyway. Yeah. He also claimed CM Punk's moves put him to sleep. The two men lock up to start things out with Cassidy and connecting with a knee strike to gain control. Punk responds with bringing the youngest star to the mat and he begins working on his injured shoulder. As we know, Max Cassidy has been having the kinesio tape on his shoulder for a good while now. Punk connects with the shoulder tackle and goes to a crossbody, but Caster catches him in midair and drops him down to the knee. Punk then leads launched into the corner, but he comes back with a dive down for the top turnbuckle, following up with an atomic drop in in lower suplex. Punk then goes for the knee in the corner, but misses the nails a big chop to the neck, followed by a fisherman buster. However, Punk is able to kick out. Caster then heads up to the top rope, but Punk scouts it and flies in some chops. He then hits the hurricane runner. From the top rope. This time Punk does nail the knee strike, following with a running bulldog, and this time with Max in, in, time in. Max kick out of a pinfall attempt. Castle then distracts the official. Anthony Bowen pulls Punk's leg as he attempts a springboard. He gets hung up on the rope and Castle leaps from the top top buckle with a shot, drop kick. Max Castle goes for the mic drop, but Punk ends up hitting a tombstone, followed by an Anaconda Vice for the pin for the submission win, and CM Punk is your winner. Pretty good opening match here. This is the first of many, many opening matches tonight. Um, um, good, great matches tonight. Honestly, there wasn't one bad match on this show. After the match, Shivani comes to the ring and he's like, Oh, Punk, what you did last week, you know, the motioning thing, what was that alluding to? And Punk's like, dude, you're smarter than that. Come on, Tony, you're smarter than that. About, like, South Carolina, what does this mean? As he mentioned, motions, championship, discount, double check um, championship thing again. And he says he doesn't know who the champion will be coming into double or nothing. It could either be Adam Cole, Bebe, or Adam, or he's going to be getting, dealing with some cowboy shit. He knows that before his time is over, he will be, there will be more gray in his beard, there will be more scars on his head, and he will be AEW World Champion. Obviously, that is the right direction we're going. CM Punk will be the one to dethrone Adam Hangman Page. We'll hold on to the title to probably either All Out or Full Gear. I'd say probably Full Gear, give him a nice lengthy title reign. And then have MJF be the one. Well, honestly, MJF beating CM Punk in Chicago for the world title would probably be the best way for them to go. CM Punk loses. Like would win the title at double or nothing. Hold it for till August. Lose it in his hometown. To MJF, the heat, the heat that MJF would get when he wins that title. I would not be surprised if people started throwing shit in the ring the way that he would probably win the championship. And then the next Wednesday, he is going to have one of the worst. He's going to have one of the best heel heats, proper heel heat coming out, celebrating being the AEW world champion. That's what I'm going with. 
I say MJF is with FTR's Mark Sterling is seen putting pictures of Warlow, which alerts the for security. MJF says he doesn't exist in this universe, but the pinnacle does. He says they're going to get some wins starting tonight with FTR. Dax interjects and he says MJF is the friend, but Warlow is too. We don't like whatever happens between you guys and him and you two is not our business. MJF says they are more than his friends. They are his family, which Dax looks like he's like really, dude. You're gonna pull that family line out after we fired Tully a couple weeks ago. Clearly, FTR is heading towards the babyface turn. They're just not there yet. And... Yeah, says, I didn't want to tell you guys this, but Wardlow used to talk shit about you all the time. He puts his hands out, and his hand out for the pinnacle, you know, hands in the middle thing, which Dax and Cash um, don't really want to do it, but they know they're reluctant to. Obviously, they're going to be the next ones to turn on MJF. Everybody's turning on MJF. Except for Sean Spears. Sean Spears is always going to be MJF's stooge, in my opinion. So, MJF will soon be down. The pinnacle would soon be down to just Sean Spears and MJF. John Moxley versus Jay King Lethal. King Lethal has been on dark and dark elevation majority of his run in AEW. Don't know why. Maybe they haven't. Maybe they were trying to wrap other things up. Um, they had they had their they had their plans in place between Full Gear and um, Revolution. Jay Lethal was not part of those plans. Now Jay Lethal is on here. He last week lost. He, he got screwed by the undisputed elite, as they're being called now, I guess. And on Rampage, he he's he's like starting to lose. It's like I'm get I'm getting screwed by these guys. They're all getting opportunities while I'm not. And there's got to be a better way. So Jay Lethal is spiraling out of, is going to be spiraling out of control to the point where he's just had enough. And he's probably going to have a heel run very, very soon. He goes up against John Moxley and you knew this match was going to go one way. But my God, was this a damn good match. Jay Lethal, I hope, is, I hope the plans are in place for Jay Lethal to do something between now and the rest of the year on TV. Because him and John Moxley went to war. Just like Danielson and Yudagu later, this was not a wrestling match. This was not a fight. This was a war. These two beat the absolute shit out of each other. Obviously, Moxley was winning. The Blackpool Combat Club is in the middle of being built. And obviously, this is just a, stepping, a step in the road for John Moxley. Now, of course, Jay Lethal will be, will be on Supercard of Honor this coming Friday. As he will be taking on the master of Taga style, Lee Moriarty. Will that have anything to do with the way AEW is? Will have any momentum for Lethal? No. Has nothing to do with that. That's just a different, that's a different universe, as they say. Back and forth, this match went over and over. They hit each other hard. They beat the fuck out of each other. This was one of the best matches of the night. Lethal gets out of them with a pinfall attempt and then follows with a uh, brain buster. Jay then heads to the top rope and nails the elbow drop, but John Moxley kicks out in the last second. They did mention that Moxley was a little too far away. So when Lethal hit the elbow drop, he didn't get enough of it. Looks for the figure four, and Moxley reverses and almost catches him into a cradle. When they get back up, Moxley is able to connect with the Death Rider out of nowhere for the one, two, three. Now, before the match happened, Jay Lethal put his hand out and was like, dude, let's have, like, uh, I, have, I respect you. Out of respect, I want to shake your hand before the match. Moxley just smacked it away. And said, let's just get this match over with. After the match, Lethal's down. He looks like he's got emo He's very emotional because he just keeps... He can't win big ones. He can beat all the jobbers. He can beat Serpentico and all the other jobbers on Dark. But when it's against Adam Cole, Ricky Starks, and now John Moxley, he can't seem to win the big one right now. So Moxley comes over and puts his hand out. I don't know what he said. He's pretty much like saying, dude, we went out to war in this match. You earned my respect. Shake my damn hand. Jay Lethal gets up. He's got emotion on his face and everything. You can tell that he's not happy with the fact that he continues to lose these big matches. But he shakes his hand anyway. And that was honestly a damn good match. Maybe one of these days we can see John Moxley and um, Jay Lethal fighting, fighting it out for a championship of some kind. The video package for Mumina Shafir featuring her dark matches as she looks to be moving up from dark to the main product. So, 
We're going to Shafia getting some love. I hope everyone's ready for the problem because she's going to be a problem for AEW. Apparently, Maria Shafia is going to be getting the next TBS championship match. Both women are undefeated because, you know, that's just how it works. And Mark Sterling wanted to give Jade the match, or give a match against Leva Bates. But, yeah. And he doesn't sound too confident about Jade beating, uh, beating Marina Shafia. Which, honestly, if it was me, Marina Shafia's beating Jade Cargill. Jade not, should not be a champion yet. FTR versus the Ass... I'm, the Ass... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the Gun Club. Not the Ass Boys. That's, that's very disrespectful to call them the Ass Boys. The Gun Club. Who... MJF comes out after the match, before the match even starts, and Dax and Howard begin with Colton Glenn. Um, the crowd is chanting ass boys to these guys, and you just see it on Dax's face. He's just got this, he just can't help but smile at the fact that the crowd is just serenading these guys in ass boy chants. Now, the match is just an overshadow with what happened during the match, because we're having this match, it's a pretty good match, when all of a sudden we see backstage. There is the man Wardlow just coming through, beating the shit out of every con every co um security guy coming his way. Beating the pillow proposed. MJF is on commentary. He's trying to tell these guys, the security, to do your damn job. Wardlow is beating everyone up. He's coming down. He's coming from where John Moxie would usually come down. He's beating up like these poor souls. These poor like. Future wrestling talent who in South Carolina, probably um, a couple indie guys um, or trainees at a local indie um, gym. They're just getting their asses beat up. And eventually enough security get onto Woodlow and he gets taken away. So he has yet to get to MJF. They're holding this off till, of course, double or nothing. Where MJF is, prob is going to need to lose. He's going to have to lose. But it's between that match and Double or Nothing and, and All Out, which is uh, three months still. MJF could go on a tear and just win match after match after match and get to that world title match. But that's neither here nor there. After this happens, Billy Gunn gets on top of the on the apron trying to help his sons. But ends up not working out. Big rig to Colton. Uh, Hold on. Yeah, Colton Gunn. I'm sorry, no, Austin Gunn, 1, 2, 3, and FTR gets the win. After the match, and the crowd was all on FTR's side. Like, of course, the Gun Club are the heels. FTR is being the pseudo baby faces right now. That's where they're at. After the match, MJF comes down to raise their hands. They pull away and is like, dude, what did we fucking tell you? This is our business in the ring. We don't want anything to do with this, and you're going to bring that shit here? And they are just not happy about... MJF and the Wardlow shit happening during their match. The crowd is chanting FTR. They want them to do to him, to MJF, what Wardlow did, and stab him in the back. Eventually, and MJF grabs each one of their arms and raises them up, and they're like, fuck, we'll deal with it later. So that is that. MJF is going to be losing allies left and right very, very soon. And I can't wait to see that when it all comes down to it, Woodlow is going to have MJF all to himself. There ain't nobody who's going to be able to stop and Woodlow for giving MJF what he has coming to him. So backstage we have the um, JSA, the JAS. Echo Appreciation Society. Jericho saying it is the truth that they, he's the influencer. He says nobody else can join if they ask. They can get, go at GFY, which he's trying to get that over, and I don't think it's working. Garcia mocks Santana Ortiz and Eddie Kingston. They take a peek at one of the curtains, and nothing's going on. Jake Hager says, we beat them. They ain't coming back. He opens the other curtain and gets hit with a slapjack, and we have a brawl between LAX and, well, the former LAX and, and, and JAS. So they fight all the way back to the ring. Eventually, the numbers get too great, and the JAS beat the shit out of these guys. Take a slap, like Jericho gets a little strap and just slaps 
then just straps the back of Eddie multiple times. They stand tall, and that is that. Danielson versus, with, versus William Regal versus Wheeler Utah. Now, everyone says when, like, Road Dog went out there a couple years ago and said wins and losses don't matter. Honestly, they really don't if you do what the AEW did here tonight. This is how you get a young man over without having to win. This is how you build somebody up to the point that everybody in the crowd wanted to see Wheeler Yuta beat Brian Danielson. And even though Brian Danielson, of course, was going to win, it wasn't one of those like, ah, oh, he's dead. Wheeler Yuta's buried. No. These two, just like Jay Lethal and John Moxley, but I think twice as bad, hard, beat the ever-loving shit out of each other. Wheeler Yuta took everything that, Ma that Danielson g gave him and just kept firing back. To the point where Brian Danielson went to go start kicking his head in and Wheeler Yuta spit in his face. Wheeler Yuta is a bigger star, is a, big, is a bigger deal now than he was going into the match. Wheeler Yuta is going to be a big piece to AEW in the near future. I could see him being, by the end of next year, a TNT champion. World champion, maybe a little stretch right there, maybe in five or so years. But I could see Wheeler Yuta being the TNT champion between now and the end of 2023. Just going to put it out there. I just hope they don't do and they don't have a misstep like they had with Sammy Guevara and all that shit because whatever they're doing with him now is just ugh. Danielson takes the match uh, uh, control early, hitting his forearm strikes to the chest, and he looks for several pinfall attempts. Yuta blocks it with a bridge. Danielson drops him with a shoulder tackle, and he then loads several kicks. However, Yuta then charge, charges out of the corner with a drop kick. Yuta goes for a drop from the top turnbuckle, but he gets caught with a kick in the midair. Danielson hangs up Wheeler on the top rope and continues with more kicks and finishes off with dropping down with the knee to the back as Yuta's neck. Wheeler, Yuta attempts a couple of kicks, but Brian Danielson drops him down and just hits just one of his own. Brian hits several huge chops, but Yuta fires up and fights back, only for Brian to take him back down with several more. The two men then go back and forth with the chops and strikes, with Brian hitting a rolling elbow strike. However, Yuta bounces off the bottom rope. And then hits a German suplex. Beautiful. Brian then hits a dragon suplex showcasing his own skills, but Yuta kicks out again. Brian hits some elbow strikes to the head, but Yuta then fires in some of his own. Which, like, he's getting hit with those elbow strikes from Brian Danielson, and then Wheeler Yuta powers up and starts elbow. Like, he, like, Danielson went to go do something, Yuta reversed it, and then starts elbow striking himself, and the crowd is fucking in to every single thing Wheeler Yuta is doing. This dude is going to be a big fucking deal. He then goes wild for attack, but Brian avoids it and hits the sight blue psycho knee. Brian looks for the stomp in the head, but Yuta decides to spit in his face. Brian's like, oh, really? And just starts stomping him in the head. Hits a gotch-style power driver. Locks in the submission for the submission victory. And Brian Danielson is your winner. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Again, Wheeler Yuta is more over now than he was going into this match. This is how you give somebody credibility. This, like, yes, people can lose and still get over. It's such a novel concept, ain't it, WWE? How can we can't get guys on your product to be as over as Wheeler Yuta was in this match? Wheeler Yuta, by the end of this match, was more over than everybody in WWE not named Brock Lesnar or Roman Reigns. Doubt it. Don't doubt me. I can't wait. Like, I'm very intrigued to see how this goes because we didn't stay on this for very long. They, sw they went to um, some backstage thing for a second, which doesn't seem to be on here. But we went to commercial break, like, immediately afterwards. So, the Brian, like, Wheeler Yuta trying to... Prove himself to the Blackpool Combat Club is continuing, and I'm sure he's taking on John Moxley in the near future because that's going to be something very interesting. But Wheeler Yuta definitely is going to be someone to look out for, and honestly, putting him with Danielson and Moxley is one of the best things they could do for this young man. He's going to be, he is going to be a pillar for this company. 
Willy Yuta is definitely. I remember when they first, when he was first uh, on Dark, just the guy losing, and then one week we had a match end, and the loser was le- was being helped out, and Willy Yuta is just coming in for the next match, and he won that match. Next thing you know, he's teaming up. He's um associating with the best friends, and his career has been going that way. And then the Black Fool Combat Club comes together, and he starts to go a different way. And we're starting to see a badass, I can take anything you give me type of person Wheeler Yuta is. And I can't wait to see what happens. The night he wins that TNT title for the first time, it's going to be a big fucking deal. Is it going to be anytime soon? Probably not. But the way they're building him now, I could totally see Wheeler Yuta winning that TNT title. No doubt about it. So we have the undisputed champion, undisputed elite championship celebration. By the way, they can use the undisputed arrow hand signal again because you eat. Haha. <laughs> Adam Cole, Red Dragon appear, and my God, does that AEW title look fantastic over Adam Cole's shoulder? He's not going to be TNT. He's not going to be AEW champion in the year 2023. That's going to be CM Punk and MJF more than likely. But by the end of 2024, Adam Cole will be the rightful wearer of the AEW World Championship. Mark my words. I just feel like that's... Eventually, we're going to get there. Just right now, it's not his time. They had the titles, and they have some tape over the um, nameplates so they can have their names written on them. He says the actual champions are not here tonight because we weren't, they weren't invited to the party. They are ashamed. They, took their, we, they made it so easy for us to take their championships. And they need, Cole says AEW needs a new era to take control. Kyle Riley says it seems he sees haters saying they don't have enough wins, but Kyle says they're wicked and everyone loves them. Ratings don't, the rankings don't matter, which sometimes they don't. Fish then says he will put their resume against anyone in the industry. They are the three baddest dudes in the company. Cole says the celebration goes all week long. However, we hear Adam's, Adam Hangman Page's music pay, um, play. They say, oh, he's not here. We see a white Tesla drive up with JBL's bullhorns on the front. Why? Do we really need to have, oh, look, it's Hangman Page. We got to have bullhorns. No, we didn't need that. Adam Page is not from Texas, so why the fuck would you put bullhorns on the front of his Tesla? Give me a break. So he starts brawling with the Undisputed Elite. He takes down Red Dragon and then launches the Cole across the ring. But as he goes for the Buckshot Larry, the tag team pulls away Cole. However, when they try to escape, Jurassic Express and Christian Cage appear. They brawl with the group and then Cole gets stumped to the outside, taking out his pals. The champions take control of their titles again. So, news came out today, just so I can throw this out there, that Marco Stunt will not be back in AEW. Marco Stunt's contract is coming up May 1st and he's not going to be re-signed. Budget cuts and... um. Bloated lo- I mean, pretty much a bloated roster is cited when Christopher Daniels talked to him why they're not bringing him back. Honestly, Marco Stunk should be thankful for the three years he got in AEW because there were so many people, so many people, when he got signed, that looked at AEW as like, really? You're going to sign that guy? And basically, Marco Stunk, the only thing he was really good for was being so good at looking like that, like he was dead on his feet when somebody like a Lance Archer or Miro wrestled him in a match on Dark. Marco Stunt's time in AEW went way longer than I think it, and then I feel it should have. Honestly, he's just one of those casualties of getting talent that are going to help build this company for the future. And Marco Stunt was really just not somebody that you can really do anything big with. Just like um, Sunny Kiss will probably be on, not signed again. Um, Joey Janela is gone. You know, Avalon's probably going to be gone too. It's just, they are, the, they, they are these year one guys that AEW just needed names for the, to fill out their roster because they just want, they weren't an established brand yet. And now that they're an established brand, guys like Joey Janela and Marco Stunts and others that you're going to probably hear between now and May, just gone because they. Like, Tony Khan's got to look at his checkbook and look at his payroll and be like, 
I'm not paying. I'm paying these people, but I'm not getting enough. Like I'm not getting my money's worth. So why would I want to resign a Marco Stunt? Why would I want to resign a Joey Janela if Sunny Kiss is gone in the next few weeks or next few months or so? Why am I going to resign Sunny Kiss? Because Sunny Kiss is not somebody I'm getting the value for. If you've been on dark and dark elevation for the last year and a half. And you're not doing anything else other than Dark and Dark Elevation. They don't need you anymore. AEW has grown, grown, you grown, like, AEW has grown past you. And honestly, like I said, John, like, Marco Stunt, he's not going to be somebody that's like, oh, Marco Stunt's not been on TV. He hasn't been on TV in six months. Has anybody noticed? No. He was the Jurassic Express mascot. He wasn't somebody you're going to sit there and take seriously. You're never going to put like build him up to be a champion of any kind. The only most the most memorable thing Marco Stunt did in AEW was when Negative One came out on dark or on, on dark and ripped him to shreds on the mic. That was the most memorable thing Marco Stunt did in AEW. He can go work for GCW. He can go work for a, a, um, um, AIW if there's still a thing. He can go work for OBW and anywhere else G, like JCW, GCW, the LA what LA fights or whatever they're called over in the LA area. He's his time in AEW. I guess it was an amicable release. Maybe he can show up on Dark and Dark Elevation every once in a while when they're in his hometown. But honestly, there was not any reason to keep Marco Stun around. And it's not. And yeah, they say budget cuts. They say a bloated roster, but honestly, it's just, you got to look at the value of people that you're signing. You're going to re-sign an MJF, you're going to re-sign the Young Bucks, you're going to re-sign a John Moxley, you're going to re-sign um, Chris Jericho, you're going to re-sign Pride and Powerful. You're not going to re-sign somebody like Marco Stunt who's got no value left in AEW. His value towards AEW has dried up at least a year and a half ago. Tony Rosa comes out, got interrupted last week by the perennial first challenger to the women's champion every single time it seems like, Nala Rose, but this week she doesn't get that, that doesn't happen, that she says it's a shame her accomplishments were cut, her celebration was cut short, but she is the champion and the first Mexican woman to do that, she's also the first um, woman to hold the NWA and AEW Women's World Championship, just saying. She fought her way to the face of this division, but she doesn't want to just be the face. She wants to be the face of all women's wrestling. She thinks that they're all every time she tries to get up to where she wants to, bullies want to pull her down. She says pillars get knocked down, but foundation remain, and she will be that. She's ready. Rosa tells Nyla to get use her words, or does she have, need Vicky to dumb it down? She wants to wrestle the best in the world, and she will defend the title. I still don't understand why is Nyla Rose always getting the first championship opportunity? Why? She was the first person. She, like, Riho beat her for the championship to win the title in the first place. She beat Riho to win the championship, then lost at the Sheeta, and I'm pretty sure they had a rematch a couple months later. And here we are again. We got, like, the previous champion, the Faker, she was the first challenger. And here we are again now. Rosa is the champion, and she's the first challenger. Why? Can we get rid of Vicky Guerrero? Nala Rose never needed Vicky Guerrero. Nala Rose is fine. All she is is a big honking, honking monster for the women's division to go out there and kill a bunch of um a bunch of smaller women, and that's what she's good for. Get a title match every once in a while. At least Thunder Rose will be able to hopefully give her a better match than the last time she had a women's championship match, which was an absolute atrocious match. Back to her backstage, backstage saying tonight. They, they might take things too seriously, but this Friday they will become the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions as they claim to build their reputation, and that's why they want to face the Bucks one more time to see who is the actual best in the world. If you remember, the Bucks beat FTR to win the World Tag Team titles back in 2020. The Bunny comes out for the Owen Hart, Owen Hart Foundation Tournament Qualifying Match, and before... Like, before anyone had any speculation of who it is, it is, in fact, Tony Time in AEW as Tony Storm is All Elite. She comes out, and you could just see the smile on her face. 
crowd went completely nuts for this woman. I mean, most of them are probably guys who got who subscribe to her OnlyFans. I would never do that for anybody. I'm just saying. But she just like when she got to the ring, she got on the um ape on the turnbuckle. She's like, "You guys," she's got this smile on her face. She looks so happy, so happy to be here. It's like. Who knew what was going to happen with Tony Storm? Nobody knew what was going to happen, what she was going to go. I figured everyone figured she was going to be in all of the wrestling, but for all we know, she could have ended up in Impact. Impact Wrestling has the strongest women's division in all of professional wrestling in the United States right now. So she could have easily went to Impact Wrestling and been there. But here she is in the Owen Hart Foundation qualifying match. Now, we don't know how many people are going to be in each of them, each of these qualifying shows, how, and how many are going to be qualifying. I figured we're going to have 16 qualifying matches, but that would be a little bit too much in my opinion because the tournaments are going to be in May. And honestly, I don't see them having eight matches for the men and eight matches. Well, set, like eight participants for the men and the women through the month of May. You got two tournaments to do at the same time. I can see maybe we have a four-person tournament going on in May for each of them, but it means that you have eight women and eight men doing a qualifying. So, yeah. So this match was pretty. Well, this match was pretty good. The thing is, the Bunny's best match she's had outside of that um, tag team um, all kind of anywhere match with Penelope Ford versus Anna Jay and Tay Conti. Tony Storm, of course, was going to win. You're not going to have Tony Storm come in and lose her first match. Well, Bunny, Bunny fights back. It's a Death Valley driver, but that didn't get the job done. She nails two big thrust kicks, but Tony Storm manages to kick out and stay in, one, stay in this one. Storm gets hits a German suplex and then hits a spike, a, a leaping spike. DD, um, power driver thick called Storm Zero, which I'm pretty sure that was not the Storm Zero last time I saw it. But yeah. Tony Storm is your winner. Boom. Backstage, Vicky Guerrero says Thunder Rosa fears Nala, which I don't know what the hell happened to the audio here, but, like, you could hardly hear Vicky. Nala tries to talk, and you could hardly hear her. She says she's the foundation. She's been, she was been here since day one. She refuses to be a footnote, note, and she will cement her legacy with Thunder's blood, and she will be a genie. Abacadabra, bitch. Because, yeah, saying the word bitch makes you feel, makes you sound so badass. Can we retire the word bitch from the word, from the lexicon of professional wrestling right now? Using the word bitch does not make you sound like a badass. Having everyone say the word bitch doesn't help anything. It's so dumb. Andrade El Idolo with Darby Allen, with, with Jose versus Darby Allen with Sting. This was a good match, obviously. I mean, Andrade is one of the best wrestlers in the world, top 10 at least. Darby is one of the best young up-and-coming stars, top 10 in, the, in, in that as well. Different, different categories, of course. Darby leaves... Sorry, Sting leaves Darby to do the match on his own, however, and Allen rides the skateboard. Andrade launches himself out of the ring and takes him out. That looked like that hurt. But this match doesn't even start off. Right away. Andrade and him fight on the outside. Followed by throwing Darby's face first in the ring apron. He looks to contact him. Allen moves and hit, he hits the stairs. Darby opts to use his skateboard as a weapon. Smacks him on it and then gets on the apron and does a leaping, um, whatever, like, I don't know what the fuck you call that. A leaping ollie or whatever it is. Attacking him with it. Andrade powers up Allen, trying to drop him on the guardrail, rail, but he fights out back. That doesn't last long enough as Allen Andrade grabs on Allen. And throws him onto the stairs, which is pointing upwards, and he bounces off them. Darby gets back in the ring, and the match is, and Rush like, you don't have to wrestle this, man. You, you, you're fucked up. You don't have to do this. But Darby, of course, being Darby, is not going to sit. He, like, you have to pretty much have him on, and, and like, break every single bone in his body. Darby Allen's going to get up and fight, plain and simple. So they fight. They have themselves the match here. Now, of course, um... Jose tries to come down. Sting attacks him from behind. The Butch and the Blade come down. They attack Sting. Private Party comes down eventually. Now, Darby gets, has Andrade in a future armbar, and he's trying to work the fingers to, pull, to um, add more um, pressure. Darby gets off of that, jumps to the outside, taking out the Butch and the Blade. 
gets back in, goes for something, gets caught, hits, gets hit with a buckle bomb, bat of a, a reverse buckle bomb, and then Andrade hits the um, Hammerlock DDT, which they're calling the El Idolo. I don't know how long they've been calling it that, but they are now, I guess, for the pin and the win. After the match, everybody's in the ring. Darby's being checked on by Sting, and the AA, the AFO attacks Sting. And then eventually, the Hardys come out, waiting for the music, but they eventually come out to make the save. The Butcher and the Blade will take on the Hardys in a table match next Wednesday night. We have ourselves a banger of a show coming up on Friday with Keith Lee versus Ricky Starks. The Young Bucks versus FTR. And I'm sorry, not FTR. Uh, top Flight. That's right. Top Flight. Chris Statlander will talk for the first time since ditching the alien, which I really am excited, intrigued to see what they do with Chris Statlander coming up. And so much more. Now, Rampage looks like a really good show that nobody's going to watch. Honestly, who is going to be watching Rampage when you got Supercut of Honor going on at the same time? It's going to be very, very interesting what's going to happen on Friday because you have, you have SmackDown, you have New Japan, you have the Hall of Fame, you have Supercut of Honor, you have Rampage at 10, DCW is having a show. It's going to be a very crazy show, crazy weekend. And obviously, yeah, House of Black Fuego versus Fuego Rosso, Eva Unos to Grayson, Jamie Hader versus Sky Blue in our second Owen Hurt Foundation qualifying match. The men are going to start those next week. No matches have been announced. Keith Lee versus Powerhouse Hobbs. I thought it was okay. No. Young Bucks versus Top Flight. We were here from the Scorp the TNT champion, Dan Lambert and Paige Van Zant. Nobody cares. And Chris Statlander will also speak. So. Rampage is going to be a really good show, and it's like, uh, I want to watch Super Code of Honor. I also don't want to miss Rampage, even though I know Rampage is going to be taped. It is taping right now. It's just, uh, SmackDown is the go home show. It's SmackDown WrestleMania. Um, or WrestleMania SmackDown. It's like so much going on. I could do what I'm probably going to try and do is I have an antenna behind me on my TV. That's how I watch SmackDown is on an antenna over the air because it's on Fox, thankfully. And I'm going to probably have SmackDown on my TV, Supercard Honor on my computer, Rampage on my, on my phone, and I'm going to review it all at one time. I don't know. All I know is Smack Friday is going to be a very, very busy night. That is your AEW on TBS Review. Pretty damn good show. I think this is the strongest show they have had on TBS so far. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. Find me on Minds at the Franz Club. Find me on twitch.tv slash the Franz Club. And find me on Instagram at the Franz Club. And I will see you guys on Friday for a super card of review. Until then, my name is the Franz, and I'll see you guys later.